So this is Albert Einstein, as you know, and he says space and time are related to each other in that they both can be warped and deformed and changed. They're dynamical, changing things, space and time. So I have a pet peeve about this picture. Um, you recognize this picture, but in fact, this is really the Einstein that was really important. This is Einstein from 1905. In 1905, Einstein did his work that got him his Nobel Prize. He wrote the paper that proved atoms existed. He did the first paper on quantum physics. He invented the special theory of relativity, and among other things. This was Einstein's big year, often called his miracle year. Yet you never see that picture. So the 24-year-old Einstein was really the hero of physics, not the 60-year-old Einstein we always see pictures of. This kind of gives you the, the different ages. So invented quantum physics, special relativity, proved that atoms existed. And then there's this guy who in his 30s invented general relativity. And then there's this guy that you always see the pictures of that frankly didn't do much. <laughs> he spent his whole life, later life, working towards building a unified theory that never came to, to fruition. You know? So in, in this paper, this general theory of relativity, which this particular Einstein invented, um, he had this equation. All right? This relates energy and mass to curvature of space and time. Okay? So the more energy and mass you have in, in space, the more that space becomes deformed. That's essentially the force of gravity. Okay? Gravity exists because matter and ener energy are deforming space. Um, but the weird thing about this equation is that if you study it over the universe itself, over cosmology, it says that space should be growing or contracting. Okay? Space should be getting bigger or getting smaller. Einstein didn't like this. Einstein felt, for frankly non-scientific reasons, just for personal philosophical reasons, that the universe should be static. Space should be what Newton thought it was, this unchanging background. Um, so in order to make this equation predict an unchanging universe, he added this extra term called lambda g mu nu. And that lambda is the cosmological parameter, cosmological constant, that enabled the universe to stay fixed, if you fixed it to a very special value. OK, Einstein, however, was wrong. This guy, Edwin Hubble, who was a Chicago local, by the way, um, in 1929 observed for the first time that space is growing, it's expanding. Okay? Einstein didn't need this silly term in his equations after all. So this is more or less what he was seeing. If you look at objects that are very distant, a so megaparsec, that's a million parsecs, right? So each megaparsec, uh, uh, three million light years or so. So these are very, very distant objects. This is a billion light years away much farther. These objects are moving away from us, and you can plot them on a straight line. Okay? So the farther you look at something away from you, the more it appears to be looking, moving away from you, because the distance between you and it is getting bigger. Okay? And that's true with everything. The only reason we don't notice it locally is because the amount of di distance between me and the tip of the stick, is the, the, the amount of, of the rate that that's growing is so small you can never see it. But if you look at distant galaxies and clusters of galaxies that are billions of light years away, you notice they're moving away at a considerable velocity. So this leads us to ask this question of what's our ultimate fate of our universe, right? So if you put into Einstein's equations, you take out that silly cosmological term that he put in to make things static, and just say, now, how's, how's the universe's size and history going to evolve? Well, we know it's expanding now. That's what this means here, right? We're somewhere in here. If there's a whole lot of matter and energy in the universe, eventually it will come to a stop and it will contract again and contract down to an infinitely dense kind of anti-Big Bang. On the other hand, if there isn't as much energy and mass in the universe, it will continue to expand forever and it will never close back on itself, but it will eventually slow down. In fact, it, 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 in either case, the expansion rate should be slowing with time. <laughs> All right, so we want to know whether we're in an open or closed universe, right? So you need to look back even farther in, in the history of, of our universe to, to, to get a better handle about the expansion history so we can find out which of these two we're in. 
And they, they use these objects called supernova, specifically type 1a supernova, um, to, tr to try to understand this better. This is an example of this a particularly nearby type 1a supernova, 1987. And it's, it's incredibly bright. That thing just appeared out of nowhere in the sky. That's, that's not a, a you know, especially powerful telescope. That's just, that just an amazing, uh, amazingly bright object when it exploded in the sky. So when you use more powerful telescopes, you can look at, at, at a much more distant supernova, and you can use these to tell you how, how, how fast that, that point in space is receding from you. And when they did it, they found that we're not on either of these trajectories, but something more like this. Not only is the universe expanding, but it's expanding ever faster, faster and faster and faster. But this isn't what Einstein said should happen. So to give you an idea of what could lead to this, let's just start with some, some simple equations. So, okay. Normal matter and energy slows the expansion of the universe. You know, it decelerates it, right? So essentially, the, you put matter in the universe, and it has gravity, it pulls itself together, and it prevents space from getting bigger. It tries to slow it down. That's what Einstein's equations say. Acceleration is negative g times mass. But if there's also a pressure then the equation gets changed accordingly. And if you had a negative pressure built into space, it would actually throw everything apart from each other, gradually accelerating the rate of expansion. Okay. So it turns out that if you put a pre-existing pressure into space, that's this cosmological term that Einstein originally put in to make the universe static. It's a different value. It's not the same size but it's the same kind of term in his equations. So despite you know, his original uh, motivations for using a term, it turns out nature actually does require this to be present. Okay. And another way of thinking about it is that this pressure means there's a certain energy built into empty space. Yes, there's something in empty space. I take this cubic meter of space, I take every single molecule out of it. I take every single photon out of it. I take every neutrino out of it. And there's no particles in it whatsoever. It turns out that there's an energy in that amount of an intrinsic energy built into space itself, even in an empty. We call it vacuum energy, or more recently, we've known that we've become uh, used to call it dark energy. So this is kind of a chronology. In 1917, Einstein, to make the universe static, said there should be this cosmological term, this cosmological constant. 1929, Hubble discovered the universe is expanding. You don't need the cosmological constant anymore. In 1934, he said, I have a big mistake, biggest blunder of my life. Okay. 1998, only nine years ago, astronomers found that in fact this kind of term does exist in, in nature, although it's very different. 